Crisis is a legend seared into the mind of a generation, yet an elemental epilogue to that saga is oft forgotten. Crisis Warhead is a PC exclusive, standalone Crisis game that came out a little less than a year after the original and was unclouded by the change of ambition and setting brought about by Crisis 2. With Crisis Remastered looming on the horizon, there's never been a better time to look back on it with 2020 vision to find out all those things that Crisis Warhead did right and how it was a sign of things to come and just why it's so forgotten. So gear up, you muppet. Let's go back and look at Crisis Warhead. Crisis Warhead is both a continuation and expansion of Crisis 1, but also a response to its greatest critiques. As Crisis hit the world in 2007, the world hit back. Along with all the praise, Crisis had a fair share of critics. First there is the gameplay of Crisis itself. While I may look back on the second half of the game fondly, a number of players and reviewers disliked the last third or so of Crisis where you engage with the alien threat in a more linear fashion with less freeform gameplay. So even if the levels looked cool, a lot of people did not like playing them. Next to gameplay critiques, Crisis's lofty system requirements and ultra high-end graphics were critiqued as well. As I've talked about many times for Digital Foundry, Crisis did something a lot of PC games have historically done, where the highest settings available were not designed around the hardware available at release. So turning the graphics to very high was not exactly a playable experience always on all but the most powerful 8800 GTX or SLI PCs in 2007. Even then, a number of levels strained the CPU due to Crisis being a very single-threaded game. Even with overclocks, CPUs like the Q6600 would struggle to do much on the highest settings in levels like Ascension. Even extremely modern PCs will have a hard time on these levels in 2020. Then there were concerns from Crytek itself based upon the critical and consumer response to Crisis. Crisis sold nearly 1 million copies in two months after release, but it was also reportedly one of the most pirated PC games ever. Crytek's CEO Shavat Yearly claimed that there was a 1 to 20 ratio of paying customers to pirates. So understandably, the idea of spending $22 million with a multi-year development for a single platform might start looking less like a strength and more like a liability if players would play the game without paying, in theory at least. In comes Warhead as a first response to remedy and answer this situation. Crisis Warhead was the first Crytek developed game utilizing their new multi-studio strategy, with a decidedly lower budget and development time with the entire game starting production in around May 2007 and going gold in August of 2008. The development was primarily driven by Crytek's new and smaller satellite studio in Budapest, with support by the main Frankfurt studio. So a leaner and more streamlined development, building off of that which Crisis had already achieved. And in response to the perceived piracy problem, there is an updated integration of SecureROM DRM in the retail version that limits the amount of installs to just 5 activations, so quite heavy DRM. As for the gameplay critique regarding aliens, the aliens were now much more integrated into the main combat and gameplay scenarios that the first two thirds of Crisis were lauded for. Almost taking an inspiration from Halo, the alien encounters in the game were more freeform and chaotic, with North Korean troops and aliens engaging in combat and you being able to tango with both at the same time. Whereas in Crisis 1, the levels in the sphere had aliens and aliens only on a linear path more or less, Crisis Warhead had snow levels where you were unconstrained in how you engage the enemy. There's even a part kind of like Crisis 1's town level where you infiltrate a compound. But instead of being filled with North Koreans, it's filled with aliens, where you have complete freedom as to how you enter and exit and use that gameplay space. So combat in general is more freeform and the enemies can be as well. North Korean soldiers in nanosuits are used more liberally, with them toting a greater range of weaponry and tactics. And the aliens themselves move around quite a lot more than before. 
They're not easy to pin down and shoot unless you're great at tracking fast moving aerial targets with a mouse. This and their new alien types, such as the shield alien who grants powerful defensive shields to those exosuit forms near them. So how did Crisis Warhead respond to concerns over performance and optimization? In the months since Crisis's release, a new generation of GPUs had been released, with the benchmarks from that time showing the newly released NVIDIA GTX 2080 performing 55% better than the last flagship in the 8800 GTX, and the more mid-range GTX 2060 was performing 37% better than the 8800 GT, and 29% better than the 8800 GTX, so the mid-range was higher than the oldest high range by a good amount. GPUs were making strides and putting those lofty very high settings at even higher resolutions into the playable territory, yet CPUs were not advancing in a similar manner. The next round of CPUs would only come out around two months after Warhead's release, and they did not dramatically increase single-threaded performance, which is what CryEngine 2 needs. Indeed, going back to Crisis 1's benchmarks from that era, you can see how a Core i7 series was scoring extremely similar to those similarly clocked Q-series processors. So GPUs were advancing in a way to benefit Crisis's performance profile, yet CPUs were not. So Crytek's response for Warhead is twofold to change the user's perception of the settings, and to make some specific optimizations targeting the realities of computing at that time while not reworking the entire engine. What do I mean by user perception? In the lead up to release of Crisis Warhead, Crytek was utilizing every opportunity it could to redress the consumer perceived issue of optimization in Crisis 1. As Christopher Wadai stated in an interview with Game Reactor in 2008, Well, we've changed a lot in the game actually. We have optimized the engine tremendously. Uh, it was one of the main feedbacks which we had to the community that people perceived Crisis as a very demanding and very high end game. And it is a very high end game. We're catering to a high tech crowd. But with Warhead, we decided to go for the mid range spec and we built a PC, which we called like the Gamer Warhead PC, for like five, six hundred euros. We gave it to our RD guys and said, this is your target, this is what you have to make it run. So they were in panic first, but they actually made a fantastic job. So it's very readily available and you can run the high spec on a very affordable PC. So Crytek wanted those with mid-range PCs to not be daunted by Crisis any longer. And they had to re-perspectivize the settings below very high. That gamer PC that he's talking about is reflected in the game settings. So instead of low, medium, high, and very high, Crisis Warhead now had minimum, mainstream, gamer, and enthusiast. Why are they doing this? Crisis 1 revealed a problem that is kind of now ubiquitous. People without a thought pumped up Crisis 1 to very high on release and let their frustration at the performance level be heard online by delineating the type of PC in the settings and appealing to vanity to a certain degree, it's easier now to understand how intense the settings in the game are. If you have a PC that was around 600 or so euros in 2008, and a bit more than that in 2007, then you can play at gamer settings. Enthusiast settings at higher resolution would really only be for those monolith GPUs and SLI PCs. But that changes really only in perception and skin deep. In fact, if you go through the settings variables side by side between Crisis and Warhead, you can see that the settings are now nominally higher in Warhead in areas between the similar tiers. But basically, they're the exact same. The only difference is Warhead's enthusiast setting is higher than very high. Crisis 1 on very high had view distances for detail at 30 and view distances for vegetation at 45. Crisis Warhead ups these values up to 50 and 65 respectively. So optimization was not really coming from degrading graphics or the presets, but from some behind the scenes optimization. This includes some optimizations to AI to reduce their respective cost on the CPU. There were also optimizations done to shaders to speed up the rendering on the GPU. These changes were likewise brought into Crisis 1 through patches. So if you played Crisis 1 on release on very high, the game would run noticeably better in later patches due to the GPU optimization work. On top of this, Warhead also has performance wins due to optimizations in level design. Crisis Warhead avoids massive overlook scenes where there's tons of vegetation in view, tons of objects drawn, and tons of AI units in one view. 
There's a distinct lack of huge valleys with tons of objects in Warhead. There's also no VTOL section in Crisis Warhead. There's no extremely sweeping, kilometer-long shots like you see in Assault or on Harbor. The combat encounters are still very, very large and wide and long, but broken up more often by intervening terrain. In general, all of these changes put together make the game less hard on the GPU and CPU. So while modern Crisis with patch 1.21 can still absolutely thrash CPUs on levels like Ascension, where I can see the FPS dropping into the mid 30s at worst on a Ryzen 3900X with 3200 MHz of DDR4, the worst section I could find in Crisis Warhead was a split second drop to the 40 FPS range that immediately disappeared and went back up to 60 FPS, all while cruising around and having all this crazy hectic stuff happening in the background. All the changes I mentioned in terms of optimizations keep the FPS at a cool 60 FPS for a wide majority of the larger, more hectic gameplay scenarios that Warhead has. So the largest level area in the game? That's 60 FPS with perhaps a minor drop or two here and there that are practically invisible. The impressive train section? That's a flat 60 FPS. One of the larger combat arenas on the first level? That's more or less 60 with a tiny drop here or there. All in all, Crisis Warhead is a much better performing game on the CPU than its predecessor. And really, if you had a modern Intel system with the great overclocks that those can have, this game would be a flawless 60 FPS. That is decidedly different than Crisis 1, where I can induce CPU related drops on any number of levels with a lot of AI and those overlooks with tons of terrain, objects, and vegetation, and really not just on the infamous Ascension level. But with those changes, did the game live up to the infamous reputation of the original? Crisis Warhead is on an updated CryEngine 2, so it really does all those things that Crisis does to great effect, like the incredible presentation of outdoor areas. Crisis 1 was pretty amazing at communicating that feel and ambiance of a dense forest and vegetation. Warhead continues this tradition with a few embellishments of its own. When staring at the jungle floor in Warhead, the ground is marked with 3D-like terrain from parallax occlusion mapping. Then another layer of scattered geometric detail is there for fallen and withered leaves and twigs. And then on top of that, there are other smaller new details like tiny fungi. When you turn off the HUD and just sit there, the denseness of the frame and the atmospheric sounds come together to communicate that feeling that you're really in this wilderness-like jungle. One key aspect that Crisis 1 does to achieve this and Warhead takes a step further are the inclusion of fauna in the flora. Chickens in Crisis 1 are famous. And Warhead gifts us with tiny treehopper frogs that bounce around on the ground and look surprisingly realistic in movement thanks to the great per object motion blur in this game. There are also overly large spiders creeping along the jungle floor. Rats infest the dank corners of indoor habitats and sewer-like locations. And keeping in line with Crisis tradition, you can of course pick these up and look at them up close. Though I do not recommend using the rats as melee weapons, it's not too effective. Then you have the snow environments in the game, which Warhead pays particular attention to in its graphical makeup. There's a newly added in thick ice shader, which looks to have a certain parallax depth if you look at it. Like here, if you pay attention to the shadow cast across the surface of the ice, you can see how that shadow casts through into the ice and gives off the look of subsurface scattering, which is pretty impressive shader work for 2008. This effect is used across the massive frozen waves that you can see in the hovercraft chase scene, or in my favorite area for its technology, in the ice grave where you are transitioning from one part of the mountain into another. It's not just the ice shader here which makes it look so interesting, but the fact that the cave is generated in the game editor through the usage of voxels. Crisis Warhead and Crisis are unique games because they also had the ability to utilize voxels to create horizontal holes in terrain, which normal height map terrain of course could not achieve. It was not used very often in game, but just here or there, and when you see it, it looks really great. 
Beyond the graphical features, Warhead looks to utilize large worlds that CryEngine 2 enables to create some unique sequences that I think is best represented by the train section. Now this is a sequence we've seen in many, many games. You're on a train, speeding through to somewhere, shooting up baddies. In most games this is a thin and purely linear level with repeating geometry or procedural geometry generated on the sides of the train as it goes by. It's more like the level moving around you than the train actually moving. It's smoke and mirrors to convey that feeling that you're going someplace really fast. Warhead takes a more crisis-like approach to the concept where you can travel on the train of course, manning its various gun emplacements, but at the same time it is actually a train moving through real terrain. It's not an illusion, so you can get off at any moment you wish, do what you want, and then run back up to the train using speed mode to follow it back to its destination. The train even stops once where you have to get out and infiltrate a base full of enemies at a train depot to get the train back on its way. So the path is wider even though it's linear and it's more free form, and it even opens up to a wide linear combat sandbox with the depot section. So it's quite different than the more linear but typical move to the front of the train thing that we've seen in many games. While the game plays on the strengths of Crisis 1 with visuals and gameplay, not everything is perfect of course. One of the greatest strengths of Crisis 1 was the blend of cinematics in first person and first person gameplay. Crisis Warhead instead has cutscenes from the third person with detached cameras. This generally gives the cinematics a more disconnected feel in comparison. This is then compounded on by the generally more lackluster animations found in these sequences in comparison to Crisis 1. This is probably not due to a technical concern, but more to budgetary and time reasons. As I say this, the story is still entertaining enough as it's played more loosely with a heavier emphasis on Hollywood action stuff, more so than the original Crisis. Being on CryEngine 2 also means it inherits some of the technical weaknesses that Crisis 1 had, specifically in indoor scenes. So while Crisis 1 pioneered screen space and an occlusion, it did not really have any real bounce lighting or image-based lighting like Crisis 2, just a flat, ambient color and shadows. This worked out well enough for outdoor areas with large-scale ambient occlusion combining with screen space ambient occlusion, but indoor areas that lack direct lighting and shadows look a bit odd. So the mine areas in Warhead look great with the harsh lights and shadows and even sparsely placed volumetric lighting here or there, but the areas inside North Korean bases that lack shadow maps look really flat and not too great. Then there's the general change in color tone from Crisis 1. For all of Crisis 1's emphasis on post-processing, it actually had a very natural color tone and image processing. Outdoor scenes and their color temperature and curve were modeled on photography and not ultra stylized. It made Crisis 1 look uncannily natural. Crisis Warhead goes for punchier tones and color, so the time of day in many levels is set to a yellow or more orange sun color around dusk and daybreak, and it would appear that they also upped the post-process contrast at times, so the game almost looks a little black crushed. This is a matter of taste, but I prefer the original color palette of Crisis. And lastly, even though this is just a small nitpick, Warhead launched with an NAN error on one of its material shaders in the Swamp Tree asset, and it's really always bugged me. This error manifests as tiny black drops that can be picked up by the motion blur in an especially bad way. It's just a blemish on an otherwise great presentation. Now if you want to play this game today, I have a few recommendations for you. The first would be to go to the PC Gaming Wiki and download the Parallax Occlusion Mapping Anastropic Filtering Fix. Otherwise, Parallax Occlusion Mapped surfaces will not get anastropic filtering. If you are using HDMI to your monitor or TV, the game will probably lock to 24 FPS or something when you start it. It's an annoying CryEngine bug. So either hit Alt Enter three times to enter windowed full screen mode, or if that does not work, set up a custom resolution in the control panel that is one or two pixels larger or smaller than your real resolution. Then select that in game and the problem should be gone. After this, make sure you use the 64-bit EXE. It runs better in CPU limited scenarios than the 32-bit one and will not crash on modern AMD systems. Then I recommend using my custom auto exec, which is linked in the description, and you just need to drop it into the game's main folder. It will up the resolution of shadows, have shadows apply to a number of particle effects, other nice things like prevent texture streaming since modern GPUs have enough VRAM anyway. 
Lastly, for the daring, you can experiment with adding transparency supersampling with the NVIDIA driver. Warhead has a lot of foliage, and while the in-game edge AA you can enable was pioneering and works okay, it is imperfect. If you use Edge AA set to 2 and set MSAA in game to that which you prefer, and then use the enhanced setting for the Crisis 64 bit EXE in NVIDIA Inspector, selecting your preferred level of SGSSAA, it will actually apply transparency super sampling to the vegetation. It'll run like a dog at ultra high resolutions like 4K, even on an RTX 2080 Ti, but you're getting perfect image quality. In the end, Crisis War had definitely achieved its technical objectives. It ran better than the first game and was a less risky release given its development time frame and budget. At the same time, it's the first step in the controversial steps away from Crisis 1's design. The graphical settings being designed around catering to a middle spec was something that would be further doubled down on in Crisis 2. And while the game is thoroughly like Crisis 1, the more constrained combat scenarios do not impress and offer as much player freedom or replayability as classics like Recovery, Relic, Assault, and Onslaught. Perhaps this is the reason why the game is forgotten. That ambition of Crisis 1 through its no-nonsense graphics and massive, wide linear sandbox levels are what made it stand out, perhaps, and which awed an audience and gave it the legendary status that it has. Toned down variations on that, like in Crisis Warhead, might be of high quality, but conclusively less impressive and historically relevant. Good, but not genre-defining or once-in-a-decade like Crisis, which basically threw all caution to the wind. I can only assume that it was not as successful as Crytek would have liked as well. Going back to that interview from earlier, there's things to note about Warhead. And then can we expect more chapters in the Crisis saga? Well, who knows? I mean, there, there are several strands, you know, we have Prophet, for instance, in Barnes, so a lot of characters we can toy around with. Uh, Chad once mentioned it was a trilogy, so we'll see. We're very uh, actually excited about Warhead and see how it does as well. And see how you guys like it because that's the most important thing. If it's positive and you can say, okay, we want more of this. So we have tons of options we are looking at right now with Crisis, and we're going to take it to the next level. So Warhead could be seen as a testing of sorts, and as the interview states, the future could depend on Warhead's success and other routes were possible. Given how Crisis's PC exclusivity ended after Warhead, or how the level design became even more constrained in the games thereafter, or how the aliens went from fast flying creatures in Warhead that you had to really use a mouse for, to less unique and slower bipedal foes in Crisis 2 and 3, well, I think history shows that Warhead was not the future that was to be for Crisis. But still, we have Crisis Remastered to look forward to. And until then, I hope you enjoyed this look back at Crisis Warhead. If you did enjoy this video, then hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, then please hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to see more content like this in the future, consider supporting Digital Foundry on Patreon, where you have access to years worth of DF content in high quality available for download. If you want to talk to me about Crisis Warhead, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen!